Welcome to Wisco Dice. Hey, yo, folks. I am your host, the Conzie with the most. And on today's episode, I will be joined by the one and the only, the Meeple's champion, Justin. We'll also have the Ghost Walker himself, Matt, on the show. But of course, let's not forget Suzanne. This is episode 113 of the Wisco Dice Tabletop Gaming Podcast. And today is August 21st, 2023. On today's episode, we'll cover a whole passel of new to us games that were sent to us by various publishers for, to check out and review. But before we get into the talking about those games, let's dive into the games that we've been playing. Okay, so we are going to start off with some games that we have been playing recently. And the first one up for this episode is Sunder Seven Wonders with the Cities and Leaders expansions we added in this time. So... This is a game that has been around for quite a while. Uh, I'm sure many of you have played it, and if you haven't, it's definitely one that's worth checking out. I kind of consider it one of the classic games that everyone should try right now. Uh, it's published by Repos, and I will have a link to their website in the show notes if you want to take a closer look at the game. The, one of the great things about this game is it plays anywhere from two players all the way up to seven right now. Uh, and that takes about 30 minutes, no matter what your player count is. I think everyone on the show here has played this game. So a little bit about this game is that it's the core mechanic is this card drafting where you're taking this deck of seven cards and you're kind of drafting one and passing around the table to your neighbors who are then taking one. And so it's very simultaneous. You're taking these cards and then you're building a tableau in front of you. There are three rounds of drafting of seven cards. And throughout these three eras, they're called, you're going to build stages of your unique wonder. And each stage is going to give you some bonuses to help you with the game. These cards that you are picking have different groups and do different things for you. Some of them provide you with resources. Some of them allow you to get discounted resources. Some of them have other bonuses or give you upgrades later in the game. There's military that, so that you can fight your neighbors or defend against them, whichever way you want to look at it. And then there's just, you know, cards that give you bonus points because who doesn't like having bonus points at the end? So... This was just, you know, that's just a high level view of this game. It's quick to learn. It's very easy for new gamers or someone who's not played the game to pick it up and play like in a game or two just as well as a seasoned player does. Uh, the expansions that we play with, we added the leaders expansion, which gives each player a unique leader ability that can help them. And if you pick your leader and your a seven wonder right and just play it right it can make some really good chaining abilities that way and then the city's expansion adds another set of cards these are these are cards have a black back on them and then they can also give you some unique abilities or benefits that way this is like i said a game that's been around a long time and i think everyone here has played it it's just a lot of fun to play with a group of people and it goes very quickly. So I ask the rest of you what you guys think of Seven Wonders. This is definitely one that I own in my house. Um, I will say, just as a heads up for everybody, when you get, if you get the more recent release, I think the most recent release is only listed at three to seven. The older release did have a two to seven. There is a two player version of this game, but it is one that I own and I keep in my house. It's great for pulling out, especially if you're playing on a weekend where you're having a, a big board game day. This is a great game to just kind of kick things off. The thing I really like about it is, as Suzanne said, it's simultaneous. You don't have a lot of downtime where you're just like, oh, I've got six other people playing their turns. I can go take a nap or stare at my phone. 
you're always doing something you're drafting cards and then you're you, there's always actions to do so that's one of the reasons i like it it feels like it goes quick yeah seven wonders is one of those classic games that i feel like if you are a tabletop gamer at this point and you've been playing or feel like you diversely want to play a lot of different games that it is one of those ones that you you need to put in your must play list is it the best card drafting game out there no but it is kind of the the game that when it came out became the signature game in the card drafting genre of games so i there certainly are games that we had i personally like better than seven wonders like among the stars but seven wonders finds a way to get back to the table a little more often because it's a little more flexible at player counts at the various player counts that said i don't like it at smaller player counts but it's a great game it's still hits the table uh and one that i I remember playing many 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 games of back in the day when it first came out especially my copy is very worn from all of those plays like you said it you know it may not be the best card drafting game but what i do enjoy about it is that when you add these little these expansions in it doesn't add a lot of complexity but it just adds something different so i feel there's a lot of replayability i have not played among the stars yet you know seven wonders also seems very reachable with its theme to a wide variety of gamers or non-gamers beginning gamers alike i'm curious if the city's expansion was like a significant expansion or if it just kind of added a little bit what would you say how did that impact the kind of normal standard gameplay? Well, the box size is the size of all the other normal expand of all the other expansions for it. Yeah. Um, well, the Babel expansion is pretty huge, but oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah. except the Babel expansion, the other standard expansions, it's about the same size box. I yeah, it wasn't that much more complex. It was a few new cards, a few new things to like, th- there were more combinations. I would say that it more added because there was more ways to earn points. And that, that one of the things I like about it's not perfect, but seven wonders is, is that there are multiple strategies to win. One person could go full military and do very well. Yes. You have to earn other points too. Cause it is a bit of a point salad at times, but you know, but you could do very, very well, earn a lot of points, just going heavy on military. And another person might go heavy on science. And the next person might go, I'm just going to get a lot of victory points. So it was just kind of gave you that twist of, Hey, there's a totally different mechanic that I can look at to earn some more points. So, I, I mean, it didn't feel overwhelming to me because I'd never seen the city's expansion or the leader's expansion and adding those two into the base game. Cause I was familiar with it did not feel like, Oh my God, I I'm losing my mind staring at all these new things. The leaders in particularly would be nice if they had a reference guide consolidated for all of the various possible leaders that are in the game. But I'm sure that that's a problem. I haven't looked, actually, since we played, but I'm sure that problem has been probably rectified somewhere on, on Board Game Geek, where you can just download a file and there you go, and you have everything you need with a consolidated list of all the possible av- uh, leaders that are available in the game from the der- various different expansions that came out just because there's a lot of like it starts to get some unique symbology and stuff like that on the on those that you're just trying to remember it, it, i think when the leaders expa- the leaders started to come out they started to try to re- remove some text from the cards and move more to a symbols based system which in the second edition that matt's had and i've played his co- i've played second edition it's like all the cards are just symbols and there's no like a lot less words on them so they didn't have to worry about translating the copies of the game for as much but anyways i think that's seven wonders with cities and leaders great game worth checking out on to goblin vaults from thunderworks games now back in episode 104 if you remember and if not you can go ahead and listen to it we talked to keith at thunderworks games and uh, about this game it was just coming out and he did give us a, uh, the opportunity to play it with him, which uh, Justin, I remember uh, being a, a particularly memorable and or <laughs> oops filled session. Yeah, my, but my, uh, <laughs> my, my brain wasn't working when I when I learned that game for the first time. It was a uh, did not click for me immediately. Clearly, 10 a.m. in the morning, Justin needs more coffee than whatever he had. <laughs> yeah. 
besides that, uh, uh, we also just, I just would note that we just uh, released on our YouTube channel a how to play video. So if you're interested in this game, if it sounds interesting, you can go check that out to find out more information or learn how to play the game. But effectively, uh, Goblin Vaults is a card game where you are playing as one of five different goblins. The game's for one to five players. Sitting around a table in the dark recesses of Colback Prison out of the prying eyes of the Construct Guards. I mean, you're looking to just try to gain a little prison resource in the form of these cogs, which are basically parts that have fallen off the prison guards. That's apparently what the black market is in Colback Prison anyways, is for those cogs. But anyways, during the game, you're going to bid, I guess is the best way to determine four cards that are in the block. Uh, basically, this tableau of three cards that are out available. And of those cards, when you, you know, if you win one, you get to add it to your vault. And all of the cards want to be in certain positions, or maybe you want to have uh, certain suits. You certainly want suits of your faction, as well as other variables that you're trying to, to score. And there's different, the end game scoring changes from game to game. There's different cards you can put out. Plenty, there's plenty of them in the box as options. And uh, which, is pr which is kind of a staple, I think, of, of Thunderworks games. And I, I've had a lot of fun. I've played this game probably, I don't know, six, seven, eight times now. I've taught it a few times. It's 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 been a blast. I really do enjoy it. What did we get it out? I think at a board game night or something most recently. Just or a board game day maybe. To, yeah, it was a board game day. We're just trying to fill fill a little time, got it out to the table and taught people quick. And uh, it was a, as a kind of a filler game. Worked really well with that. Love the art on the game, on the cards. I, I I can't, there's, I mean, I don't think there's a Thunderworks game that I don't it really appreciate the art on. Card quality is amazing. For a little game in a pretty small box, that's, it. the quality of everything's pretty much top notch, right up there with anything I'd expect in a board game. And, and like I said, it's a, it's a fun little game. It's not one that I would go, like, crazy on. You know, I go out, go out of my way to play, but it's nice, it's a nice game to pick up and play as a filler. And is pretty versatile at filling different player counts. Yeah. Oh, I was pleasantly surprised with this game because the bidding auction mechanic usually makes me not interested or not want to play the game or play it and kind of just feel like, oh my gosh, this is kind of pointless. But with how this game works, you are always getting something to put in your tableau, whether you win the bid auction or not. So you can kind of use that to your advantage. So that is definitely a nice point with this game and it plays well at the larger player group too. It should be fairly quick if people are paying attention and are knowing what they want to do and what they need to do type of thing. That is always pretty cool with this game. Like you said, it's it's kind of, it's also Goblin Vaults is in this the role player universe, I believe, right Ben? Yes. It ties all of these Thunderworks games together that are set in this universe. You see the same artwork you see some of the same kind of card layouts, some of the same iconography, but yet each game is just so different and appeals to a different interest in game mechanics. So I, I definitely think that's really cool with this game. I just played it the one time. We made it out on Thursday night, and it was a lot of fun. I had a good time with it. It was not that bad to pick up and, and play, and like you said, it... The bidding mechanic was interesting because sometimes you get a little bit of one-upsmanship and stick it to them. But uh, otherwise, like you said, you always come home with some sort of fabulous prize and then you get to add something and try to make your stuff the best it can be. So. I can't say that I found a bad, I don't think I've ever found a bad Thunderworks game. But, you know, is this, is this on the same level as Cartographers? No. Is it a good game and worth checking out if you get a chance? Absolutely. So that is Goblin Vaults from Thunderworks Games. Check out whiskodice.com for links to the games we discussed. And while you're at it, don't forget to leave a review of this podcast wherever you download podcasts. All right, so we'll dive into the hobby corner next. It's going to be a pretty brief hobby corner as apparently I'm the only one that's had a hobby inspiration this past month. Corvus Games Train, who is a company that produces a lot of SDLs for a lot of 3D printing projects. 
just ran a Kickstarter for what they call their Paint Pal Studio. And it's a series of SDL that you can print to basically customize your paint workstation to be whatever paint pots you want, whatever set of heights you want, drawers. Do you, if you want paint holders, do you need an airbrush holder? Heck, you got the, I think they've included a paper towel holder for in this project for things you could print and, and add and customize your paint station and the custom widths and everything. It's absolutely kind of crazy what you can do with this. I'm super stoked. I finally have enough of it printed so that it is basically the same length as my old paint station, which were a number of these MDF kits, but it holds about 20 more pots of paint in the same space, actually in about two inches less space, which is awesome. And I, I still got to print drawers and I've got another extension and you, some might ask, Ben, why did you have to print paint, st paint station for yourself when you already had an MDF solution? And, well, Ben would answer that he can't stop buying new paint colors and ran out of space, so the paint pots were starting to line up all over his paint workspace and making it literally a mess and frustrating to sit there and paint at. And just by adding this and adding the height of it, because uh, I added, I printed some risers as well, it picks it up higher off the table than it was before, so I can see all the paint pots in the back and stuff a little bit better, and I can see things better because it sits, stands up over the height of the miniatures and everything. So it's made things a lot easier to paint at my station. Sure, the paint pots are all crowded a little bit more, but uh, like I said, I think it's it's made a a significant difference in the clutter look out of my paint my painting table, which honestly is one of the things that's been keeping me from sitting down and shooting some painting videos is that my table was so cluttered so this is really getting me in that right step and hopefully i'll have have that shot project finished one one more set of uh pot holders and whatnot that i need to that i'm going to have at desk level instead of on risers to kind of sit in on the front left hand side of it and then print some drawers and away it should go and I should hopefully be in good shape then to start shooting a little video for my for painting tutorials so you guys will have to let me know what you might want to see me show you how to paint particularly if it's a uh, Knights models or Batman miniature game stuff or actually board game stuff all right and so just so that the rest of you can see this I'll make sure that I have pictures for Wisco or for the blog post that goes out with, with this episode on our website at wiscodice.com so make sure you check that out Hey folks this is the Conzi of the most I just wanted to take a moment to tell you about Misty Mountain Games here in Madison Wisconsin where you can find CCGs RPGs board games minis paint and hobby supplies for your all of your tabletop gaming experience and needs. If you can't find it online, give them a phone call or swing on by their brick and mortar store uh, here on the east side of Madison. Don't worry, that is MistyMountainGames.com. Check them out today. And we're back. So here at Whisker Dice, we have gotten to the point of success or under success that occasionally publishers send us copies of new board games let us with us hoping to be able to play test them or to uh do a review or mention them or talk about them so we we actually got a, four different games that were uh given to us or or loaned to us uh as either review copies or in the case of one of these which we will mention was loaned to us from our friendly local gaming store misty mountain games uh to check out and see how they play and create some content about them. And so I, I want to caveat that and say that say that about these games as we get into them, that these games were given to us as review copies. I don't think that really biased us in any way. In fact, it gave us an actual opportunity to get all of us together to sit down and play some board games for a day, which was awesome. I really appreciated that. And more importantly... Keep it coming. If you're a publisher listening to us, we're more than happy to check out your games. Small, big, family party, strategy, hardcore Euro, especially hardcore Euro. 
<laughs> it's miniature game. Send us miniatures for the game, though, please. And uh, whatever the case might be, um, RPGs, we're happy to check those out as well. If you need to know where to send those, just email us at host at wiscodice.com. And otherwise, with that, why don't we talk dive into our first game, Dragon Bond, Lords of Vala from Draco Studios. Matt, why don't you tell us all about this game? Yeah. So this was the first one we sat down to play as a, as a bigger group. It is a territory control game. And the premise is really around uh, there are this battle for this particular region of the world where dragons are trying to do their things and there are human players. So the human players are, I think of this as sort of like a frontier where the humans are trying to establish cities and, and build up armies and take control where the dragons are going, my territory, my stuff, and you are crunchy and taste good with ketchup. The whole premise is really that the dragons are trying to gain power, and so are the humans. So they are trying to take control of various regions of the board. It has a very interesting mechanic from the perspective of every round starts with whoever is the first player. They There is an unknown event that is going to kick off the round, and that's placed face down. And then going around the table, starting with the first player, you place a card that will dictate either one or multiple actions that you will take. And then the next player puts a card down and a card, and they all go face down. So we don't know what other people are playing, and we don't know what their plan at, plans are. So and we go through a planning phase, and it had a really nice mechanic where at some point somebody can say, I pass. And as soon as they pass, you cap off the stack with another hidden event that you don't know what it is. And whoever just passed it becomes the first player, unless they were the first player. Then they have to pass it off to, is it always a human player, Ben? I can't remember. So whoever, if, if a dragon player pass, passes, they have to pass it off to a human player. Or no, if a... If a it's if you, uh, if you have first player already. Yes, uh, that's then, it. Have then you have to pass it to a human player. Right. So yep, get otherwise you get it. Yep. Yep. So there's a lot more that goes into this game. There's a lot of, I will say, craziness that can occur where you decided to take an action and then you didn't realize at the time because in your head you're going, oh, I'm going to move here and then I'm going to do this and that. Well, you didn't realize by the time you got there, somebody else's army that was six strong is going to be standing in that zone so you may have to pivot and do something a little bit different, or you may have to realize you've got wasted some cards. Um, yeah, it's it, it's action programming, but you do have to be ready to adjust your plan on the fly if possible. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, overall, I mean, I, I'd be interested to hear what you guys thought. I mean, I thought the overall quality of the game and we got a base copy of the game. It's not like a like every I know some people would be like, oh, did they give you the Uber Deluxe? you know, Kickstarter version or something. This is just the base retail copy of the game. Um, I thought the quality of the components overall was pretty solid. The um, artwork was nicely done. They had these really big, prominent miniatures. The biggest complaint I would have is actually, I think the board had like two sides and they're identical, but one of them was very artistic and very well drawn, but was actually very hard to see the zone markings. And the miniatures almost took up too much space in the zones. I mean, they were they were decent miniatures, but they almost took up too much space. But otherwise, I mean, I liked the printing. I thought the cards were well done. Um, they like we were just the overall quality of the components. I thought was pretty solid, but and the game was fun to play. So. Yeah, I, it makes me wonder if they maybe have like a extra large game mat version of the map to kind of upgrade your board, you know, so that your your giant miniatures fit on there a little better. Yeah, maybe. I I had a great time playing this game. Matt and I both took the role of dragon players. When you're the dragons, everybody's trying to gain power. With the dragons, one of the keys is that when you attack and defeat enemy troops enemy units from the human players the, they collect and you get to you know eat them essentially and that is a way of one of your chief ways of gaining power so while 
human players are trying to build up armies with units to kind of defend and control their areas, you can kind of swoop in on areas they've left behind and gobble up their troops to gain power and, you know, avoid the big fights or whatever. One aspect that we haven't talked about yet either is that there is a sort of alliance mechanic in the game, which is in the name of the game, it's a dragon bond. Basically, any time that a dragon and a human, uh, the, their general, the human general, who's the figure controlled by the other player, are in the same location, provided they weren't um, fighting each other, there is a chance that that human and dragon become dragon bonded. And you roll some dice, and if you basically both roll the same kind of result, you actually become allied at that point and will be sharing the victory. I thought that was a fascinating mechanic to kind of potentially force people into alliances. And uh, at some point during the game, I was getting attacked a, a bunch by Ben and I think mostly Ben. And like my dragon was a little bit weaker than Matt's. And uh, it just became obvious to me, like I, I was doing pretty well with power, but I knew I wouldn't be able to hang on to it if I kept getting attacked all the time. So I put myself in a position to get bonded and then basically Ben and I became allies for the rest of the game. So I thought that was a a really neat aspect. I think you were trying to get bonded with Suzanne and it just ended up being that, uh, (laughs) I kind of got lucky and you and Suzanne, because it's, so it's bonding isn't just an automated, automated thing in the game. It's a dice roll and you both players have to like basically roll a matching success. Yeah. Which is like 60% of the time on the dice, on each dice individually. But what what was kind of hilarious is that, you know, and you have ways you can re roll those dice and stuff like that as part of that Dragon Bond check. But it just happened that, like, the times that the two of you tried to Dragon Bond, the person who would roll the failure didn't have the ability to re roll. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so then, yeah, J- Justin's dragon just happened to glide into a spot where I was standing, and or where I moved to. Ah, do not meddle with. You do not trust those people. They are much more tastier than my people. But I will let you <laughs> feast on them. It's fine. I don't care. I was kind of like this. I think dark. Like my fra- my human faction was. A little darker, evilish, sacrificey, maybe power magics, controlly magics kind of thing yeah. is what they were based around. I don't know. I got kind of the feeling from looking at a little bit of the fluff. That's kind of what their their stick was. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it felt kind of yes. Come, just eat my people. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I mean there there were some. I liked the fact that there's some randomness in there, and the events could do some major things too like the yeah. events could cause people in certain regions to take damage the events could cause more power to just drop on the ground and suddenly there's a region to go to the reason to go to that region or it could cause a bunch of troops to spawn in certain areas and suddenly you know that region that might have been cleared out is suddenly full with you know npcs and it was it was interesting because it, the board was dynamic things were always changing you might think you were out of position one moment and the next moment there's there's a bunch of stuff in your region to do. And so, you know, it, it, it definitely had some dynamic levels that I think would add to its replayability. It is worth noting, like, as a human faction, that, like, our game that we played, the there was a real lack of power that ended up on the board yeah. early in the game. Yeah. Um, the, the board starts kind of seated with all the non-controlled regions having a power token sat on them so that everybody should be able to pretty easily get one or two the first round. But then after that, it's you're really dependent from the humans factions, I felt like, from either you either have to attack the dragons, which are hard to pin down because they're pretty mobile, yep. mm-hmm. or you have to be kind of sprawled out. And one of the things is the game randomly pops power onto the board through those events. And you don't know where the power is going to spring up or even if power is going to spring up on events. So from a human player perspective, that kind of feeds you into a strategy of, well, if I want to get power, I need to be sprawled out more across the board. And then wherever the power pops, that's where I need to like recruit and, throw my army and react to which if you're not there when it pops 
guess what? Big Baddie Dragon's going to come along and take it before you get there because they're just too fast. So, yeah. so mm-hmm. there was this like this interesting thing, like, oh, well, I feed into the dragon strategy by making my troops small and not camping them up and sprawling all over the place. Or I consolidate and play like traditional like territory control mechanic and make big chunks of my troops and build them up and grow them on on smaller territories and hope for the best or hope that I can pounce on the dragons. And so it turned into a pretty aggressive attack the dragons kind of game. And Justin's dragon just happened to be usually in the position of I'm going to get beat on for, or he was in position to get beat on a lot um, early. I don't think, I, to me, it didn't matter which one of the two of you dragons were available for the pounding as long as somebody was available. <laughs> I was pretty confident I could pound them. Yeah. I was going in. I, the, uh, I, the, I took my beating too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. There, the one thing is, notice there isn't player elimination. So even if like you lose your general or you lo- the dragon dies, it just respawns it just, basically on the board. Uh, or you doesn't even, you don't even respawn. You just retreat and uh, to a, an adjacent area. And the only time you can actually be truly eliminated is if you can't retreat to an adjacent spot for, there's a couple of rules with retreating. And at that point, that triggers the game end. Right. It, yeah. So you're not ever sitting there stuck going, oh, this sucks, I was eliminated. Now I have to sit here and watch the other three play for 30 minutes to an hour, which is really nice as well, even though that didn't happen in our play. Yeah. I do appreciate that, like, in a game with really a big, pretty big focus on combat, there is a way to stay in the game after being, you know, handed a defeat. You know, you're not out of the game entirely, which is, is really nice. I, I like that a lot about it. Suzanne, did you have any thoughts about this one? Yeah, I mean, this one, I think Matt kind of hit on the things I struggled with with this game. And is playing with the human, it just kind of felt like there wasn't a way to get power. I was totally dependent on trying to build up an army and chase the dragons around. So it was, it kind of just felt like I, unless I managed to get bonded to the dragon that was winning, that there was, it was kind of hopeless for the humans. <laughs> on the game uh so that was a little it was a little frustrating to just get into it and i was i don't know i just kind of wish there was some other element that allowed me to i don't know do something i'm not exactly sure what but just do something more than put out an army and run after dragons so um like fortify like if there was a better way to fortify or something like that my towns and stuff but i mean it's a fun game i like the theme uh it just maybe isn't the game for me yeah i I will say like i wish there was a little more of that from a human player perspective of being able to build up your locations maybe to be able to hey now you've established a city because there are you can't establish cities but they're just basically extra wounds to be eaten to prevent your troops from getting wounded wouldn't it be nice if you could like establish a city and then establish and then have that city become fortified or become a castle or something like that. And then you could have that castle become some kind of like science capital or magic tower or something like that. Right. To that, that would then like, Hey, I have a, I have a, my castle has turned into a wizard's tower. And now that wizard's tower is generating power. And now Mm. it gives me a little bit more of something that, well, if the dragon player or the other human player doesn't come in and break this up, I might just win the game because now I have a power generating engine that I can mm-hmm. sit here and camp and play defense on. And so there's there's no benefit to maintaining and defending my areas really, because unless I wounded a dragon far enough that it had to retreat, I, and then that was like what one power is all yep. I could get. Like there was no benefit to keeping and defending my cities and my I, area. I think the only benefit could be that rare, that, that chance event where it drops power in your region, you control like that would kind of be the only thing, right? Cause then you're like, okay, I definitely get, I can definitely get this power. Cause I got a huge army built up in this region where it happened yeah. to drop power. So it's still pretty random. 
Yeah, because I don't think it ever happened. The one time I thought it happened to me, I could not, I didn't see the the different um, definition of the two areas. And so it actually wasn't in my area. Uh, and I got all yeah. excited. But <laughs> yeah, I think Whoa. the whole game, it was like one power that got dropped in my area, I believe. Yeah, that was kind of how I struggled with it. And And I think to Ben's point, it is random. So that's the only kind of downside is, is I kind of ended up on one side of the board and I made a bad tactical decision and, and I spent a few rounds licking my wounds, but all the power appeared on the other side of the map. It was yeah. random. It could have totally dropped in the region I was standing in, but I was always like on the wrong side of the map when the power dropped. So the other dragon kind of ran away with it, but could have just as easily happened the other way. So. Well, and at the same time, you can't necessarily plan for power dropping because it happens with a random event. You would yeah. have had to anticipate that and play the card that lets you get that power almost without right. <laughs> you know, sort of guessing yeah. that it's going to show up, which is tricky. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I thought it was a fine game. It's just like there's a, a lot of random elements to it that could allow one player to kind of run away with it. But it would, you know, if they do, I think they'll it'll go quick. So, I think the game was is definitely much more about, and I think the game is trying to very much pr promote the player versus player aspect of the game, right. uh, and the attacking yeah. and 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 not a reward. And there are so many, uh, and I think some of the things I hear us say are things that in a more traditional area control game. It's much more about camping. Like we, we had just talked about risk in a, a, a different episode, and how like that is the tr the traditional classic territory control game, and that right. is very much about camp and build your troops, and you need to outnumber your opponent two to one before you can be pretty sure you're gonna get victory over them mm -hmm. uh, if you go in and attack. Uh, you know, at least historical classic right. risk, anyways. And, like, this is definitely a, a game that, well, if you sit in camp, we're not going to really give you an easy mechanism to empower yourself. And I think that's partially to balance the way the dragons have to play, which is a very right. aggressive style. They do need to eat the people, and I don't think the dragons, in order to be able to beat the camped humans, the dragons would have to be much, much more powerful than they currently are in the yeah. game. They're not saying that they're not powerful at all, but they would have to be much more powerful, I think, to counterbalance Oh, that. yeah. Like, attacking one region with a leader and three very similar risk, three various troops where you have the artillery, archers, and melee, or whatever the heck it is. I mean, if you don't if if you if you attack a region like that as a dragon, that's dangerous, yep. right? I mean, if it was three just like NPCs, you might be okay. But a but a general plus that they're going to be rolling a lot of dice against you. So unless you roll really well and get a lot of crits, odds are you're going to be facing a lot of dice that will do some serious damage to your dragon. Yeah, I think I think we we all need probably another play and maybe a chance yeah. to swap different factions right. so that mm -hmm. uh, we all can play maybe from the human player, the players that play the dragon players can play human dragons, can play, you know, humans can play dragons to, to really see from both perspectives and kind of get, get to a point where we could do a true full review of this game. Yeah. But it was a pretty fun game. Generally speaking, definitely understand where Suzanne's coming from. I felt many of those same things. I think I locked into okay, I just need to be aggressive and attack a little faster than uh, Suzanne did in the game. But uh, uh, I did miss some of that from that civilization build. It's like I felt like there could have it could have had some a little bit more civilization type building things that would have made would have maybe made the dragons a little more reason why they were coming in and attacking a little bit maybe the dragons were yeah. a little pissed off because we are building civilizations in what they perceive yeah. as their lands yeah well th there are a, a slew of expansions it seems like as well so maybe there's some of that in there we'll have to see yeah yeah no idea all right well that was dragon bond the lords of vala from draco games 
Next up, we played The Expedition from Low Tech Games. This is a game for one to three players. This game was, we were pretty much wrapped up after playing another one of the games that we're going to talk about later on. But this game, again, also provided as a review copy. It's a very small, uh, single, like, deck of card size box game. You basically lay out a grid of planets that form a a uh, three by three grid. So there's these nine planets and then you're moving around on these planets, depositing exploration cubes and trying to match patterns and whatnot that, uh, the, of the scoring cards that you have in the first, when one player scores two scoring cards that triggers the end of the game, we finish up the round and whoever has the most points wins. Of course, where you have cubes on the board are worth points based on the planet that you would have that cube on. And of course, I I missed when I was explaining it, the one other factor is that when somebody else moves on to a zone where you already had a cube, they remove your cube and place, and then then when they move out of that zone, they place one of their own cubes. So there's like a constant, like, take that kind of almost mechanic to the game. But what I think we found the most, and I'm going to say this early in this kind of discussion of this, is this game felt like advanced tic-tac-toe. I I wish there was just a little more to this game. The things that can be said in its favor are that it plays really quickly. You set it up, it's there, you're you're playing in moments. The rules are not complex, and you get a nice little hand of objectives that you're trying to accomplish. So it's real quick to, to jump in and start playing. Again, I wish there's a little more meat to it. As you're describing it, though, it actually kind of made me feel like this was like a really boiled down area control game because your guy goes to a space and he gets to leave a cube. So now that's a zone you control. And your goal cards are all about control this type of like a put have a have a cube in three of four corners or have cubes all in a column or all in a row. And it's like so quick moving. I don't think I really saw that when we were playing it. And I mean, maybe you can say tic-tac-toe is an area control game, I guess. (laughs) But I think it's a little more than tic-tac-toe. It's not my favorite game, you know, that I've played, that we played that, that we played that day. Again, wish there was a little more to it for my, for my taste. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was super quick to play. Um, I will say, and and they, they do assign points to them. So these cards or I'll call them objective cards. Do have points, I think, commes- com- commensurate with the difficulty of doing them. Yes. I thought, at least, Ben, you had like three cards where two of them seemed almost impossible in a three player. And that was my only struggle with it is like some of the patterns would be insanely difficult to do unless somebody else was trying to do a pattern that had nothing to do with those spaces you were trying to be on. So, I mean, that was my only struggle with it is like some of the scoring cards seemed really hard compared to the other ones, but. Oh yeah. My, my three cards. So the higher the point of the card. uh, So like a four point card, the cards were like two points, three points and four points, right? Right. These objective cards. Mm -hmm. I had a three and two fours, which means that those are much more difficult in my hand. And of course, we're playing this for the first time, so I'm sitting there thinking the whole time, like, man, this is hard, but everybody else's cards, if they're this hard, we're going to be playing this for a while. And then somebody scored like a two-point card and then immediately turned around and scored a two-point card, and I was like, okay, the game's over. (laughs) Well, that was great. I didn't even have a chance to complete any of these objective cards. That said, I mean, I I did have... I did do an okay job of being in position where I scored decent points on controlling planets, but not nearly as money as, you know, the person who was able to score their objective cards and ultimately win the game. But you played it all of, like, teach and play was all of maybe 15 minutes. And if you knew how to play this game again, I bet you you'd just bang out play after play after play in like five minutes. Like, it's it's not a long playing game. It, yep. It's definitely one of those games that it's small enough that you could haul to, like, if it, you were going out to dinner and you just wanted to have something quick to play that was, like, you could play it at the table, you know, or in the bar, just waiting for the games, you know, for time, you know, the ordered food. 
it's going to be 15 minutes up. You could bang out two, three games and, you know, pass the time instead of staring at your cell phone. So I think that has some merit to it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a different type of filler. Hey, yeah. which, which one of you, uh, uh, I don't, we'll order whatever you want. No, no, let's order whatever you want. Oh, let's just play a quick round of this and whoever wins they hit, they have to order what they want. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, okay, that is the expedition from Low Tech Games. Uh, we'll probably do a playthrough on the YouTube channel at some point just to kind of showcase what the game is in a bit more detail. So keep your eye for that. Next up, we have Drinker's Duel from Shady Pets. This is one that we did play on the YouTube channel and did a uh, live play as well as a tutor, uh, teach on how to play it. So you can go check that out right now today. But Justin, why don't you tell us about Drinker's Duel? Yeah, Drinker's Duel is another uh, single deck of cards game. Um, in the game, you're going to be competing with the other players to build a tableau of pictures of different kinds of drinks by laying out cards in front of you to try to combine those cards and, and position them so that they create a, a complete drink picture of, say, beer or wine or tequila shots. The goal of the game is to to basically complete three complete drinks before the other player. There's also a little bit of take that. There's some, oh, I forget what they're called, but there's a card you can throw at your opponent that basically says, ah, you can't score for beer. Make them have to reconsider their what they're trying to build towards. And then there's also some cards to kind of prevent that. You can uh, you know, play a card to sort of block their attack, I guess you could call it. But I think it's it was a really quick game, easy to learn. Um, I think the art on the cards is pretty nice. You know, you got to build a little tableau of these different drinks in front of you. And, you you know, you're trying to combine like the top left corner and the top right corner and then the bottom left and bottom right corner of like four different cards to assemble one drink. And you're trying to place those cards so that you can assemble other drinks. And that happens really quickly, which I, I felt was kind of a satisfying game mechanism to just keep building these cards out into your little tableau. I think it is intended as a game, again, to play like at a bar, just as a quick filler or something like that, with maybe my only real criticism being that because it's using standard playing cards and you're arranging them into just this big kind of brawling tableau in front of you, it's going to take up a lot of space. So that's that's maybe one thing against it for for using this as like a filler game at a bar or something like that. I, I thought it was enjoyable for what it was. I mean, again, one you can stick in your pocket and take along with you. Matt, did you have any thoughts on this one? This one? I liked it. Like you said, the art was good. It was a fast play, but I mean, I have the same criticism you do. It's just too big. It takes up too much space. If you were taking it out and about, um, you know, like two of us playing on, I'm going to call it a fairly standard size gaming table we were sitting on opposite corners and we were both taking up a lot of space in front of ourselves. So yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty good size game uh, from that perspective. Cause it's just like, I, I think the cards could have been a little bit smaller and it would fit a lot more compact. But other than that, I mean, it was fun. It was quick. It was, you know, you could rack and stack this one multiple times in pretty quick time frame. Yep. Yep. So I'll just add that. Yes. This one takes up a lot of space, but I, thought it carried the theme of the game through it very well. So, yeah. you know, oh, it's yeah. themed on cocktails and then you have drunk cards to make it so that you're, that you play in front of your opponent. So if they can't, you know, score those like kind of saying like, Hey, you've had too much to drink. <laughs> yeah, if you are the one with the drunk card in front of them, you can put a card on there that says, Hey, Nope, I sobered up. So I'm good to keep going. And then also, alternatively, you can play a card into your tableau that has a water symbol on it, forcing your opponent to take a water break and rehydrate before they can continue building their tableau, you know, before they can continue drinking and building their tableau. So, you know, I, I kind of liked it for that. Just not that I like the theme of drinking, but just that the theme was immersive in this game. And you could rebrand it with other different themes it would still be a fun game. It'll still take up a lot of space. But I also did like the size that it's a deck of cards, so you're not going to lose it as easily. You can throw it in a drawer and find it again. It was definitely a fun game for me. I don't know, Conzie, did you 
How did you enjoy it as much as I did? I really enjoyed it when we played it as the two player. We were getting ready for the to shoot the playthrough and the video, and then we played it right away again. And I wasn't tired of it when we were doing the video. I was actually excited. I wanted to play it again after the video. I can see us being like a best of three. One of the, you know, you talked about retheming it there. Well, they already rethemed it. So the copy that we have, Drinker's Duel, is it's got martinis and Moscow mules and tequila shots and beer and all of these, you know, classic drinks. There's five total drinks that it showcases in the art. But they're, they rebranded it to be a beer only version. And another thing that you can do apparently with it, we I, I haven't actually read this myself, but apparently maybe some advanced rules or something that are out there is that you can extend this to say like a four player game just by adding another copy of Drinker's Duel and uh, shuffling the two decks together and then finding small room for floor space to be able to lay out everybody's tableau because we have a fairly decent sized table space with our geek and son Henry gaming table that we were playing it on and it took up a good amount of space like a two-player game is going to occupy a three by five play space it was a lot of fun though while we were playing it i did really like it and the art was bright it was pretty it was clear it was yep. uh, very obvious what it was it was very well done art i thought it was very art uh, very cool looking visually the cards are nice cards i didn't have any complaints about that mm. overall very very nicely put together a little board game uh, that I would actually recommend folks check out. So that was Drinker's Duel from Shady Pets Games. All right, so we're moving on from Shady Pets to Wandering Towers. So we were loaned Wandering Towers, which is published by Capstone Games, and Misty Mountain Games was nice enough to let us borrow a copy for a few weeks so that we could try it out and hopefully even play it at our next game night or two that we have the last Friday of the month at Misty Mountain in Madison. So this is a two to six player game. It plays in 30 minutes. Even with higher player counts, it still seems to go fairly quickly. What you're doing is you are, you know, have your meeples that you're trying to get in to Raven's Keep Tower and other players and maybe yourself are moving other castle towers on top of them to hide them or to reveal them. And you're also working to fill potion bottles. So to the winning conditions are that you fill all your potion bottles and that you've got all your wizards safely in Raven's Keep. So there's a bunch of memory going on with this game. So if you remember when you were a young child playing those memory games, well, that was preparing you for this game. And there's also some strategy trying to determine, oh, should you take, you know, cover up someone's wizards or should you use a potion now to mess up the game flow? Kind of what you need to do with that. So it's just, it's a, it's a quick game. It's simple rules, but you do need to think it through. It's another one that is like, hey, you play a game and you have everything out. So just set it up and play it again and do a, you know, best two out of three, you know, best five out of seven, whatever you want to play. So, um, you know, it's, that's kind of what the game is. Um, we'll have some pictures on our website of the game itself. If you want to check that out too, but now what the rest of you did, I think the rest of you have all played this game also. Yeah. Were you as excited about it as I get? I really enjoyed this one. It's just a, there are a few games that I like to say that we pull out occasionally um, that are just kind of quick to set up just overall a fun game. And this is, this is one of those. I, I mean, there, there is memory element, but it's, you know, half the time it's, it's hard because everything's moving and it's chaotic. And it was just a lot of fun from my perspective, because it is super quick to set up. You can understand the rules in two minutes and you know, you're, you're, you're playing and th it's so quick. It's not like somebody spending, you know, 15 minutes on their turn, trying to get through all the things they have to do. You're only playing two cards and you're moving either meeples or towers. And yeah, I don't know. I just had a lot of fun with it. It was just kind of a quick light, 
fun thing that was like it always felt like it's like oh maybe i'm going to cause the tower to move so that then ben's not in position so there's a little bit of one-upsmanship i don't know it's i i just had fun yeah this is a fun game i i would consider uh picking this whole one up as like a family game i think it'd be good for playing with kids and maybe even non-gamers easy to learn yeah, I definitely, it is on the short list for my nieces for a uh, Christmas present, this game. So, Nina and Margaret, if you're listening, pretend you didn't hear that part of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I know, I know Ben Conzi would love to be playing this all Christmas Eve with the family. Oh, yeah. You actually yeah, would. Com- you would. It'd be compared fun. Compared to some of the games that potentially would get to the table, yes, I would much prefer to play this over some of the other games. I thought I thought this game was enjoyable. Probably the person here that that's gonna say be the, maybe the most negative on this one. I wasn't blown away by it. Uh, I was maybe that's because no, because uh, BK over at Misty Mountain Games has never really steered me wrong. When he was excited about a game and told me to pick it up. I picked it up and I was really excited about it and it really played well and, and, and it held up. And this one, eh, I, I could take it or leave it personally. Um, I did enjoy the game, but it, I, I don't know that I enjoy memory games. Uh, and for this being a lighter game with lighter rules, it requires you to kind of pay attention and and really pay attention then have to really remember where your stuff is. And I really just wanted to play it more casually and and laid back and and you know, okay, it's my turn. Okay, I don't have a lot of decisions. I'll just do these two things and then go on. And instead I'm feeling like, hey, I have to pay attention to where that where where are my little wizard meeples, which where what spots, what levels they are, because Oh, I picked up that tower. The second you pick up that tower, you're you're done. You have to keep picking it up. You can't put it back. There's no take backsies. <laughs> yeah, like it got me a little like stressed out a little bit about it. And like I said, I don't know that memory games are the games that I like the best. It's probably games I should play more because obviously it's a it's probably a weak spot for me in my professional life. But it just wasn't the game for me. I. I for the niche, and I'm not going to compare this game mechanically because they are very mechanically two different games. But the niche that this game scratches for me are games like that that are very similar, like in, in as far as niche, as far as feel, as far as what I want out of this kind of game are games like Whirling Witchcraft, like Quacks of Quinlanburg, oh, yeah. um, that are lighter in feel type games get a little cuter in art cuter in theme also lighter games where i don't have to take it quite as where i can just kind of be more laid back and not take it as seriously and when i'm doing things i'm doing things and when i'm not just lay back and just relax and in this one i had to pay attention constantly i had to try to remember where those work where those stupid wizards were and i kept forgetting where they were and then i get stressed out because i didn't know where my wizards were (laughs) <laughs> All right, that's enough for the. That's enough of me so, ranting so, about this game. So what I'm hearing, <laughs> it, <laughs> I want peace at home. I do not play Wandering Towers with my husband. Play with everyone else. All right. It it was a good game, and I'll play it definitely if people want to play it. Uh, but it is definitely not up there for me. And like, like, hey, I want to run out there and play this game. Okay. There well, are other games I would prefer to play that for me just scratch that itch that I have to play a game that's in. In this level of complexity, mm-hmm. well, you can play the you can play the Dragon Bond Lords of Vala game, and I will play Wandering Towers then. So, uh, <laughs> those are our thoughts on Wandering Towers by Capstone Games. And if you're more interested in checking out any of these games, pictures of the games, links to the manufacturers' websites, where you can pick up these games, you can go to wiscodice.com, find the blog post for this episode. We'll have all the links and pictures uh, and more information there for you. So make sure you check that out. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure you leave a review of this show wherever your favorite place is to find podcasts. Oh, and by the way, give us a like on our Facebook page. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Pinterest while you're at it. 
If you haven't looked recently, make sure you catch up on the blog at wiscodice.com. Hey, Brian, what's that site? Oh, darn. I forget. Uh, Justin, what's our website again? Wiscodice.com. That's right. It's wiscodice.com. And until next time, everyone, peace out.